You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Benazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That rockin' tune means it's time to rock out with the mother of all options programs, the king of the bi-weekly options segment. I think we got it all to ourselves. Quite frankly, it is the option block. My name is Mark Longo from the old optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. You guys know how to get us so many ways to get us now. You can get the show live in your ear holes every Monday and Thursday, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, via the old Mixler link. Wherever you find our content, you can find that link on the website, social media, and so on and so forth in our newsletters. So you grab it once, set it, and forget it. It'll get you all our fun shows throughout the week, not just this one. Stay tuned for that. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, get it on your schedule. You can do that, of course, too, in all of the old outlets, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher. And, of course, if you want to really dive deep into the archives of their shows, not just this one, but a lot of the other shows we do, uh, like Boot Camp and Tech Talk and all that fun stuff where the archives are, are really great and full of great stuff. Then, of course, the website and our mobile app, probably the easiest places to get all that because we don't limit you. You can go as far back as you want, all the way back 11 years now. It's hard to believe, 11 years. Not quite for this show, but for the network for 11 years. So it's hard to believe. Lots of good stuff. And however you listen, live after the fact, podcast, whatever the heck it is you do, hit us up, questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom, we do like to hear from you guys. And joining me today on the old Option Block All-Star panel, let, let's spin the wheel. Let's see who we get first. We go, uh, it could be, he could be right across the street almost, or he could be out in the hinterland somewhere, or maybe at a Costco near you. We just don't know. Let's tune in to the greasy meatball, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com, as well as Carmen Line Capital. Mr. Meatball, how goes uh, the Costco parking lot? Uh, it, I am in... The great parking lot of the world known as Chicago. Yes, that's our claim to fame. Downtown we Chicago. We used yes. to be meatpacking, now we just park. We have all the parking we have, apps. We have, we have tons. Well, that's that's what our highways are, right? They're parking lots. They, nobody moves. <laughs> these days. These days, yes. Yeah. We, we kind of, uh, we, I guess we have LA, uh, LA uh, envy here where we want to have just nothing but parking lots on our highways. So we have, we have adopted that of late. Hopefully that's a short-term thing. And then uh, it'll go back to the free-flowing lanes of yesteryear. Heading out a little bit farther where he doesn't ever worry about traffic because there's really nobody out there but him. It is Uncle Mike Dusa from RC. Well, there is Skippy Zeros and Lemonade out there, too. So those two things. The only things out there in St. Charles. Uncle Mike Dusa from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the show. How goes the Skippy Zeros and Lemonade, sir? Uh, I haven't been to Skippy's in a while, but nonetheless, you're getting me to crave it. For you sure, to say the least. Really got to get them to pony up for this show. We've given them so many free ads over the last <laughs> last year since I went out there that uh, got to have at least quadrupled their audience to at least like five people now. So uh, there we go. Skippies, cut us a check. You owe us. Meanwhile, it's time for us to keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody, welcome to the trading block. This is indeed the portion of the program where we break down all the stuff that was lighting it up on our old trading screens today. We're going to get to the earnings in a little bit. Of course, we got good old Amazon, got Microsoft, got Intel popping off after the bell 
We'll get to them a little bit, but first, let's break down today's activity. And oh, what a, what activity it was! You know, the last few sessions earlier this week, they were kind of a little bit mixed. People, markets are kind of undecided. Are we going to rally? No, we're going to sell off again. No, we're going to rally. It was kind of like those kind of mixed topsy turvy days. Uh, today, of course, most of the markets ended up firmly firmly in the green, up 1%, if not more. Uh, the S&P, kind of the Goldilocks, up about 1%. The Dow, close to that, a little bit shy of 1%. And the tech-heavy Nasdaq, up nearly 2% on the day. So just what a uh, rally ho mode, uh, kind of across the board out there in Texland. Of course, all that green on the screen means our old friend Bix Cash taking it easy off a nice 7% for all of you percent of percent out fans out there. I know you're out there. Even SIBO puts out percent of percent moves now. So everybody has given up on that battle, I think, except for maybe the greasy meatball. He's probably arguing with me right now. Uh, but yeah, right around 16 and a half to close the day out there in VIX cash land out there. Off about a handle and a quarter or so. So quite the drubbing out there in VIX land, which probably bring a smile to the face of all you out there who've been hoping for a nice, steep contango to come back into those VIX futures. And you can just watch the nice, healthy erosion as quiet markets prevail. Uh, so I was running around today talking a lot of fintech and other stuff at a big event here in Chicago. So I wasn't glued to my screen. So I'm going to toss to you guys, see what caught your eyes. Let's start with the meatball because he's already probably angry that I mentioned VIX percent of percent. What, uh, what caught your eye today, sir? Well, how about Amazon? Let's just talk about what it's doing right now. It's up $100. Uh, it's been up as much as 120 and that was after being up almost $60. So we're looking at what amounts to a 12 13% move in a day for Amazon. That is how – so the the pre-earnings ramp was um, – at, at least at this point, I doubt they're doing their conference call yet. At least at this point, looks to be um, – pretty uh pretty bullish uh intel you know we we thought that the earnings were going to be good after amds were great and they were intel's up almost three dollars the big miss that we've had so far is uh mr softy microsoft which is down a whopping dollar uh so really not down uh that straddle went out uh five bucks so or uh that straddle went out three dollars and 60 cents excuse me so uh it appears that it, that is not one that is going to at least at this point uh outperform its straddle uh, in addition to that we've got uh exxon mobile earnings in the morning and chevron so snap your fingers and tomorrow uh five of the top 10 companies in the s&p 500 will have reported and be gone so that's just something to be very aware of yeah, this is one of, the, one of the big it's days. A busy, busy day. Yeah, really busy. Uh, and that's not to count. We had Visa earnings destroyed it yet, uh, yesterday. Facebook just absolutely crushed it. Crushed it. I think when we heard Facebook earnings, we had a feeling that uh, um, we had a feeling that uh, maybe Amazon was going to blow the doors off. <clears throat> All right. And, and that's what I was watching today. Uh, the spoos just kept going and going and going before they stopped. We got up about uh, 35. The close here, uh, Mark, here, a little creepy, 2,666. I like it. Perfect. The, so the handle with, – with a handle. So the handle is 26666. That goes Not along, sure I'm a fan of that. That goes along well with my old uh, SIBO handle of DVL. So there we go. I like it. It, it speaks well. Oh, yeah, well. that's true. It speaks well to my, to my ilk there. But you're right. It is uh, hot and heavy earnings season. Good old softy kind of playing its old hand. It used to be the most reliable premium sell in the business for the better part of a decade. You could sell straddles, sell any sort of premium trade around earnings from Microsoft, and you had a 90-odd percent chance that you're going to keep most of that because the thing just never budged. And then over the last year and a half or so uh, coming up, maybe not quite two years, but somewhere in that range, all of a sudden, it's, uh, look what it was a couple cycles ago, which just blew the doors off by 4X. So all of a sudden, it's been rocking and rolling, and it wasn't quite the reliable premium sale. Maybe at least, Maybe this time... It'll get back into uh, sleepy time. You're right. They're pricing in close to four bucks on that uh, good old softy straddle. And at least they're up two bucks intraday. So a good rally for them. And then, of course, uh, off about a buck here uh, in the after hours. So I guess if you had picked up your straddle yesterday and did a lot of aggressive gamma scalping, then perhaps uh, you're looking pretty good here. But Amazon, of course, is the one everyone's got their eyes on. It does seem like ever since the Whole Foods announcement, the Amazon conversation is just 
just moved into another level. And also a lot more anti-Amazon vitriol out there uh, than I remember noticing before. Just people suddenly, that deal for whatever reason seemed to wake up a lot of people to the sheer market dominance of Amazon and how they're expanding it into other areas. Whereas I guess for years, people didn't, Maybe, at least in the broad public, didn't realize how dominant they were. They, S3, they're the backbone of the Internet. They're, they're already dominant in a lot of other places. But for whatever reason, that Whole Foods deal woke up a lot of people. Wait a minute, they're buying my organic, uh, my organic avocados. I can't stand for that. So uh, that seemed to collectively wake up a lot of people to this resist Amazon kind of movement. Uh, either way, it didn't really seem to matter today. Uh, they were pricing in coming into today right around about 90 bucks. Uh, for that straddle, it was right around 6%. Uh, the stock was up 60 intraday already, and then uh, coming on the heels of this number, uh, 95 bucks up in the after hours now. So just straight up in the after hours, you're already looking good. And then it moved, factor in that intraday move, and uh, this thing was off to the races. So yeah, you got to be kind of, these days particularly, you got to be crazy to uh, do a lot of super aggressive premium selling out there in Amazon, unless you're just really, really hedging very tightly and you're able to babysit it. And if, but then, of course, even with this, you know, so much of the movies in the after hours, so you're very limited in what you can do. Unless you have a big account, we said it before, a lot of hedging and gamma scalping in the after hours uh, for equities. Again, not ideal. That's why we don't counsel you guys to trade a lot of earnings. But we know you do it anyway, so let's move on to my old stomping grounds, uh, Intel. They, uh, they used to be fun ones to play around. Some of my best gamma scalps in history, right around Intel earnings. I just worked crazy, crazy uh, scalps. And lo and behold, I'd get filled and I'd say, what? This is amazing. Uh, not so much these days anymore, but back in the day, it certainly was that way. Uh, closed today, 53 and change, up about a buck 70 or about 3%. So again, good day for tech names in general. Amazon feeling that lift actually up more than the 2% of the market, up three and a quarter percent. They were pricing in right around 250, so right around 5%. Uh, for this name and so far on the after hours in addition to today's move up a buck 70 then in the after hours up another 319 so far or about six percent so these names uh certainly if you had some premium in your back pocket coming into this morning uh you're you're probably a happy camper just on all these moves alone it has been uh, kind of rock'em sock'em robot so far except for microsoft like you mentioned microsoft disappointing but the rest uh certainly seeming to just uh just knock it out of the park here let's look really quickly and see what was lighting it up in each of these uh, intraday here from an options perspective. A good old Am Intel. Uh, the average about a buck forty a day these days. That's decent paper. It's probably a little bit less when I was out there, but it's not bad. Uh, nearly three hundred thousand. Actually, almost exactly two two x today. They did one forty four. They did two eighty eight today out there. So pretty active. Uh, about one hundred eighty thousand calls. About one hundred thousand puts. So about two to one calls over puts. Uh, that's uh, kind of in line with what the paper I remember. Actually, I remember the paper out there being a lot more heavier, more heavily skewed towards the calls, but that was uh, that was a while ago in a different uh, different era for the big tech. Let's also look really quickly on how things were lighting up out here in good old Amazon. This name's only, Amazon only doing 150,000 contracts a day. I thought for some reason it did a lot more. Doing about 215,000 today, about a buck 40 on the calls and about 77,000 on the puts, about two to one calls over puts. Pretty interesting out there as well. Again, calls leading the charge. As these names are lighting it up to the upside, let's see how our friend Softy is faring here. They're doing about a buck 80 a day, so they're the, the volume leader out here of the three. Doing about 320,000 contracts today, about two and a half, 2.6 to one calls over puts out there as well, which is kind of interesting. Mr. Uncle Mike, I know you guys watch your strategic night as well as your your other names, your beloved Apple, not really feeling the love out there, only up about less than half a percent today when the rest of the NASDAQ up about 2%. So interesting stuff. What was catching your eye out there today in the midst of all these kind of interesting, weird developments? Well, first off, I got to say it. Never before in the history of the entire stock market has there ever been a better time to sell Amazon than was, right now. I was going to say, did we hit a broad, a broad, uh, a no. broad record? I was not aware of. Okay, Amazon. Amazon. Is, uh, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> you know, for, it, it, it's it's interesting to watch evil get inherent evil get rewarded, isn't it? Uh -oh. oh, you're angry about those so organic evil. avocados. They're aren't like you? they're like Kayentai. They're so evil. <laughs> don't you like, don't you like buying your Amazon Echo at Whole Foods, though? It's cool. Oh, th things that will never be in my house is an Amazon Echo, <laughs> unless they're paying me for it. <laughs> all right. Your data, the, you know, with all of this craziness uh, around data and, and everyone, all the ridiculousness, the same people that are like, how dare they, uh, you know, collect my data on Facebook. Then they go out and put an Amazon Echo in their house. And it's like... You clearly are an idiot and don't care, uh, and you're just, you know, are politically by. Um, 
and uh, and it, it's just ridiculous. But Amazon's up a hundred dollars right now, folks. Uh, but like I said, they're they're like Kai and Ty. They're so evil. I don't know how many people are going to get that reference, but uh, it was uh, it is the the uh, that is how they're killing it. But uh, you know, Intel, great day for Intel too. Up up three and a half, three dollars and sixty cents, an almost ten percent move in Intel right now. That, yeah, that's, that's, not, that's nothing to, to joke around that's about. A big, that's a big move and Let's for them. not forget Facebook. They're, even though they're old news at this point, they were the big news today, or at yep. least as yesterday. Yeah. Yes, they were. And you know what was nice? A, when it was getting killed, slowly accumulating some out-of-the-money calls a year out. And uh, th those work. This Facebook is uh, Equifax 2.0. It is, you know, that is basically what they are. It's, that's that's it. Oh, kudos to you. you. I do remember you saying that when it happened. So, I mean, it's it's one where I never would see the world stopping to use Facebook uh, over a little bit of a data breach because of the fact that, it, you know, I personally use Facebook, but I'm not going to put anything on there that I want to be hidden. And I'm very careful about that. And quite honestly, if people are putting in a lot of personal things, uh, like people who argue politics on Facebook, is that really necessarily a good idea? And on top of that, uh, does it ever really change anyone's opinion? That's the other question that I have on that. But no, I agree. It, it, you, you called it. Kudos to Seabass for calling the, fa the big Facebook comeback of 2018. Yeah, they were moving and rocking and rolling up again today, up, what is it, oh, about a mere... A mere 9% <laughs> today, uh, or about 14, almost 15 handles out there, up around 174 and change now. And so, yeah, they were dipping as low as about buck fifty not too long ago with all these regulatory woes, regulatory concerns. And now apparently that's at least in the rearview mirror for the time being. But, you know, that specter of regulation could always loom, could indeed come back to... Uh, could back to bite them. You're right. Could be the could be the Equifax, which was just kind of a one-off and done thing. Or we could see, uh, you know, this is the more populist issue, I think, even than credit scores. Senators and congressmen realize that they could sink their teeth into this one. So there could be some lingering uh, ramifications of that, especially when their competitors, well, not competitors, but other players in the space like Apple are out there saying we welcome regulation and they should be regulated. That uh, that tends to that tends to resonate with people. Uh, speaking of resonating and uh, data, you were talking about that earlier, Mark. Uh, before we move on to the Oblock really quickly. I was looking at some interesting stuff. Our buddy Matt Amberson, his team over there at ORATS, crunched some interesting data for us. There was an article in the journal recently about um, uh, it's hard. Liquidity is kind of drying up when you need it, which is when these big crashes are happening. And so Matt and his team over there at ORATS kind of dig some... Uh, did some digging in terms of recent market meltdowns versus some from a few years ago to see how things like displayed liquidity and size did in uh, in the options market. You can read the full article over on our website. We'll tweet out a link right now, actually, while we're doing this. Uh, but in general, it was kind of interesting because, you know, Matt and his team, they have the data. Um, they show that overall, first off, displayed size on the bid and offer. This is when things were melting down. So this is the February 5th meltdown and the August 2015 crash. So they're both about 4% sell-offs in uh, the S&P. Uh, similar moves in the S&P, but mark, options market width increased by about 102% this February versus about 48% in August 2015. So pretty much a 2x in fold increase in terms of the size of the bid offer spreads a widening out with a similar size move in the S&P. Uh, we also saw the size, the displayed size on the bid-ask spread. Uh, it decreased 28% this February, so nearly a third versus about 18% back in August of, uh, of 2015. So this is not exactly, shall we say, um, yeah, the, actually the, the historic, at the time, the setups are very remarkably similar between February and August. Uh, the move in the S&P was right about the same, about 4.1 versus 4.2. The historical vol at the time was, was pushing around uh, uh, much higher, right about 55% uh, versus 60%. So we're seeing a lot of similar setups, and yet... Uh, it wasn't, um, it, we saw the changes, the display changes in the options market, kind of, uh, kind of alarming. Mark, this is probably something you're probably dealing with a lot more out there running a couple of funds now. Uh, is this data kind of back up what you've been seeing anecdotally for a while? Or does it surprise you? No, it doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, this garbage, what, what, so for, for every time people are like, no, Amazon's the best, Amazon's the best, Amazon's the best. What has happened in the options industry is what Amazon is trying to do the retail industry, 
We have a big player that doesn't mind losing, doesn't mind tightening up markets so that there's almost no profit margin in market making, right? They get everybody out except for the very, very biggest, then they widen up markets. Uh, that is what has happened. Then you add in these exchanges, which increases the costs, and you've got now what amounts to a, uh, you know, a, um, you know, an oligopoly of market makers. There, you know, it's not a monopoly, but it's an oligopoly. There's not that many market makers left. Why would they? Why wouldn't they? If you were, if I was, a, if I was one of the four or five, six market makers left, why in the world? Would I do that, especially with auctions, with orders being directed to market makers first, you know, the, with bid ass spread rules, right? And with best with um, best execution rules. If I improve an execution and markets are wide, does that fall under hitting my best execution rules? You know, Mark, this is a little. Uh, you know, this is kind of a theoretical question, right? Yeah, that gets into the, the whole yeah. is issue of auctions too, right? Some people right. think they're the worst thing on the planet. Other people think the best thing since sliced bread, you know, and that no, probably... No, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, if, if I was, if I'm paying for order flow and I promise that I'll improve the markets, I'll get, that's the best execution, what motive would I ever have to post a tight market? Ever. Zero. None. Yeah, that's, that's part None. of the issue. And that's part it's of the reason why this, the issue. That's why the displayed that, that size. That is the 16 exchanges. Yeah. So that is the issue. <laughs> Not quite 16 yet, but we're getting there. Q1 of next year when your buddies, uh, I'll be talking to your buddies at my X exchange soon. And I'll, I'll, my I'll, be, I'll be sure to send them your regards. Uh, but uh, yes, the, uh, yeah, you're right. Those auctions, certainly probably a big reason why that displayed size certainly has, uh, has, uh, has, go has gone down as well as why the spreads have gone up. If you're not familiar, listeners, of course, you have these price improvement auctions that are kind of uh, de rigueur now out here in the option space. Everyone's got them. And they're, they can be great for retail. You get better fills. They're, they were designed with good intentions to help protect market makers in terms of really not having to show their, their best hand but, and kind of help them getting run over. But on the flip side, guess what? They're not showing their best hand now. So as a result, you got wider markets and all sorts of other issues, plaguing things. Interesting stuff. Uh, we probably spent a lot of time talking about this as well, but check it out on the website. You can see the data for yourself or head on over to the ORATS blog or ATS. They have the data there for you as well. And we can read that Wall Street Journal article kind of hitting on the same things. Meanwhile, we got to keep on rolling into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Odd Block, the portion of the show where we break down the weird, the wild, the wondrous paper that is lighting up the tape. Uh, let's start off with our old friend Tesla. Feeling the love today as well, up about in line with the NASDAQ, right around a little bit less than 2%, so quite shy, a little bit shy, right around five handles, still well south of that mythical 300 level, right around 285 and a half right now. So for all of you, uh, all of you guys out there who, uh, who I know were aggressively right in that 300 strike on the put side, hopefully... You've made some adjustments forthwith. Uh, let's look here and see what's been lighting it up. You know, we were talking on our last show, these catastrophe puts, where they lighten it up. Yeah, they were lighting it up earlier this week on our show. And since the last time we've all gathered out here on the show, they've done a lot more. Remember at the time, they were not quite over 50K uh, in terms of OI. Now, guess what? They've blown through that, threatening 52,000 open on these crazy things. On another 335, again, Jan 2019, 50 puts for all of you who may have forgotten out there, listeners. They're right up, back around a buck 50 again, right around their, their native support level of late out there. So these things, 52,000 of them open on this strike, unless you think this is just a lark. And that's not enough for you. The Jan Pars 2019, also about 23,000 open, about 70 hitting the tapes uh, so far today. No one's still playing in the March or the June. That just doesn't do it for them. Must, the Jan must really line up better with probably the calendar year type offerings from a lot of these uh, CDS players out there. And then let's look here. Jan 2020, oh, the Jan 2020 50s doing nearly 1,000 contracts today, about 900 going up on the tape, nearly 12,000 open on this strike. And those things trade in a whopping $4.00 and 50 cents so if you want an extra year it's going to cost you about three bucks on these uh 50 put strike out here so uh fascinating the par is doing about a buck 40 nearly ten thousand open on that strike so these 
Mark, I know I know you've been gobbling these things up left and right at Carmen Line, but these puts uh, continue to just light it up. 52,000 of these catastrophe puts now on the tape. Crazy, huh? Uh, not so. I mean, it, it's crazy unless you own a bunch of debt. Then it's not so crazy. Uh, it's crazy if you own some stock. Uh, uh, unless you own a bunch of stock. It's crazy unless you think that, you know, Elon Musk is a lunatic and a liar and probably doesn't sleep on his factory floor and probably sleeps in a really, 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 really nice mansion. And that he'll be fine and the bag holders will be the Tesla people. The uh, shareholders. The shareholders. So, or the car yes. holders. <laughs> little, yes. A little bit yes, of both. The bag holders. They're both in for so, a lot. Uh, yes. I'll tell you, there's a bag to end up being held in, that, but that, in this stock. And, but that bag is not going to be being held by Elon Musk. Not a chance. <laughs> but he says he says he's sleeping on the floor, Mark. I don't know. I don't know how you not believe such. A, he's such a truthful fellow. Uh, speaking of truth, let's see if we can put some truth to some of these trades we outlined recently on recent uh, shows here on the network. Uh, we like to look back in the rearview mirror every now and then and see how some of these trades we highlighted performed. Uh, let's kick things off with a uh, massive sweep of these April twelve half puts. In CNHI, in CNH Industrial, ticker symbol CNHI, we pro- profiled these first back on March 22nd on the show back then. So a little over a month ago now, we saw paper doing about 7,500 for this name that only averages 300 contracts a day. So it was a sizable trade, however you want to break it down, let alone for this one. They were doing all the oxygen in the room and then some. Someone coming in, gobbling up 7,500 of the April 12 half puts, doing it for about 51 cents. So through the offer, they're offered at 50 cents. But sometimes you got to do that stuff when you're buying up more than the, uh, what is, let's see what the ADV is on this thing. Uh, the ADV is about 7,000. So you're buying more than the total open a- open interest on the entire name. So you got to pay up a little bit to do that. And so they did. They bought through the offer about 7,500 of these things. Let's look at the chart here to see how these names performed. It seemed like it was kind of one of your uh, one of your standard hedges going up here. And the stock actually did flirt with that level. Remember, 12 half put, these things expired on, what was the date? The 20th. Uh, so looking back here and seeing how these bad boys performed, we did see the stock get much lower than that 12 half level. Quite a few times actually dipped down to about 11 and a half. So these things were bucking the money at one point. Uh, actually, several times they got down to about 1180 back. <laughs> that was right after right expiration, though. But going into expiration, these things did get down to about 11 and a half. So they were bucking the money. Uh, surprisingly enough, we did not see the closing trade you might have expected when it got down there. So I get back to Mark, one of Mark's favorite things. But if you have a hedge, Maybe you uh, maybe you take it off <laughs> when it's paying you money because you said the OI went up to about 7,600 on this strike after they bought 7,500 of them. And when they expired, the open interest was a whopping 6,650. So clearly they left these bad boys on and the stock went out uh, much higher and they ended up expiring. Where did we, we go out on the 20th? We went out about 12 Close at 1253. So actually, they were at the money <laughs> just about when uh, these things expired. So they had multiple opportunities uh, to take some off. Looks like 1200 traded uh, for around, oh, about uh, around 40 odd cents back on the 12th of April. That's the last time, big time, these things traded. Other than that, that was about it. So they took off some, maybe for, for less than they paid, and the rest not working out so much. Uh, Mr. Meatball, I know this is one of your favorite tenants over there in your classes, that if you have a hedge and it goes your way, it behooves you to take it off. It seems like our friend here, uh, perhaps not getting that message. Yeah, either take it off or adjust it. You know, you can, uh, you know, if if something gets in the money or at the money and it's working, then, um, you know, roll it. Uh, Now, the alternative is maybe they didn't make a lot of money. I don't know what the high was on this, but. The stock got there, but maybe enough time passed that uh, they uh, they didn't have a great opportunity to actually make money on the hedge. It's always something to think about. Let me look here. See, this thing's got to be a high of about, uh, according to our friends over at Trade Alert who have all the data, they got about 90 cents around that time. So uh, they, they could have taken them off for uh, a decent level. And yeah. uh, they ended up yeah. taking them off. They ended up taking off about 1,200 of them when they got 
they lost about half that value. They got down about 38 cents. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it was, they had better opportunities. Clearly, they were concerned, and they had a right to be. They were in the right, just not the, in the right in terms of timing. Or maybe they were so happy that their stock kind of came back to unched that they didn't care about the 50 cents they spent, oh, 7,500 times. You and I would care about that. These guys, apparently not so much. Not enough, at least, to take it off when it was worth double. You can always buy some more puts cheaper, lower down, and keep that train going if you want, and still keep some of that house money in your back pocket. All right, let's see here. Moving on. So, so far, that's one well-timed trade, but still a loser at the end of the day. Let's go on to number two here. This is, oh, your favorite, Mr. Meatball. This is uh, L Brands, Inc. Ticker symbol LB. They of Victoria's Secret fame. Your favorite, uh, your favorite clothier out there, Mr. Meatball. Uh, this one closing today, about 35 and a half. Pretty much unched on the day. But we weren't looking at them today. We were looking at them back on March 8th. At the time, we profiled what Mr. Rock Lobster likes to call line in the sand puts a whole bunch of these bad boys. Someone blasting out. Uh, about 20,000 of the April 37 half puts for a whopping 45 cents doing that on, let's see, March 8th. And uh, yeah, 37 halves. I was all opening uh, the OI. Uh, actually, well, let's see here. This one, another one where uh, the underlying looks like we 37 half. He kind of actually did hit it, but uh, not in time. For these were April puts, so these had expire on the 20th. So on the 20th, the stock actually did go out. Actually, these were actually in the money by uh, a couple of handles. So it looks like someone perhaps wanted to get themselves some stock because this uh, LB closed 34, shy of 34 and a half, 34, 37 on expiration there. And the OI on that day was close to 30,000, 29,000. So someone put these on for 45 cents, and these puts were worth. Oh, about uh, somewhere around three bucks when uh, when uh, these puts went out. So clearly they decided we're going to buy ourselves some uh, stock here on uh, on these names. So, yeah, interesting stuff here. Uh, looks like our friend here uh, wanted to buy some stock. And I guess he did. Or maybe he didn't want to buy the stock. Maybe he really wanted that uh, 45 cents 20,000 times. He ended up getting some stock. Mr. And it looks like right now the stock is still below that, at 35 and a half. So Mr. Meatball, he drew his line in the sand. It hit his line in the sand. And he decided, I'll take the stock. And I guess there are worse ways to buy some stock if you have to. Dude, this stock is a dumpster fire. It looks <laughs> terrible. It, this is just a complete dumpster fire. Uh, they've got earnings coming up again. And... It's going to keep going. I get why someone would want th that type of, of protection, uh, why you'd want that line in the sand, because this – I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, apparently – I don't know if you heard the trend about women not wearing underwear at all, but apparently that's uh, that's really killing uh, L brands. And, and I know that the trend is with men because I'm not wearing underwear and never do. There we go. File that under the uh... – under the information we neither wanted nor needed here on the old uh, on the old option block. Let's quickly move on from that, listeners. Get that image out of our head. And let's go back to uh, the relatively tranquil, non-confrontational, non-disgusting world of sporting goods. Uh, it's Dick's. Talking Dick's Sporting Goods. Ticker symbol DKS. Closing today, about 33 bucks, even up about 1.5%. So a good day for Dick's Sporting Goods. But we're going to go back, actually, all the way to March. Actually, be April. Actually, wrong. February 26, 26. <laughs> easy for me to say. Uh, again, someone's drawing a pretty sizable line, actually a much larger line in the sand this time, uh, with some puts. It was the March 25 puts, to be precise. Uh, over 175,000 of these things going up for a nickel. I remember the time the Rock Lobster was on the show, and he was not at all enthused by someone selling 175,000 nickel puts. Uh, it was a big day. Actually, a lot of back and forth, it seems like, on those, because uh, the net, the OI, went up by about 90,000 uh, on that after that trading day. So roughly half of that increasing the OI there. So clearly a lot of back and forth trading uh, on that, but still net opening up about 90,000 of these puts for about a nickel. And looking at the chart here ever since then, these were March. So they expired on March 16th. And let's look here. The stock never really threatened that hit 30 on the second. And then it dipped down on the 13th to 29 and a half. 
And that was about it. So it looks like these went out with about 90,000 open on the strike. So clearly our friend kept his nickel. So he made about not quite half a million, but pretty close to it for, uh, for oh, about a, this is not even, this is about less than a month's work here. Uh, about three weeks and change works here, about half a million dollars, which I guess you consider all the capital you got to tie up for 175,000, well, and there's really 90,000, but still, uh, 90,000 of these uh, puts is, I guess, a decent do, but uh, you tie up a lot of money to do that. Mr. Meatball, people always forget that portion of that. You know, you're writing these puts, oh, it's a nickel, it's free, but then, uh, you know, you got to keep some capital in reserve. So how does this factor on your return of capital, efficient use of capital usage? Would you uh, do 90,000 of these puts for a nickel to make 450? Oh, yeah. I mean, who wouldn't do that, right? I mean, uh, you know what? You know what? Uh, you know what? I, we, these are sometimes called the. We used to have a, a trade called a cabinet, which was for a penny. Um, and uh, now, and, you know, we kind of lump nickels into that as well. And my old boss, Scott Kaplan, used to say, "People who sell cabs end up driving cabs." Uh, now, I guess you'd have to. We'd have to start calling them uh, Ubers because. Nobody drives cab <laughs> yeah, anymore. But, a, uh, that analogy is sell, all sorts of gone People now. who sell Ubers end up driving Ubers. There you go. I guess we can do that one. But yeah, you're right. Uh, the old, uh, the old, uh, yeah, the cabinet kind of lost its cachet. Not really quite what it used to be out there. Now it's just a penny, which is nowhere near as fun. But yeah, when you're selling this number of puts, I guess I get it. You want to maybe pick up the stock there, but uh, it is uh, an interesting way uh, to do it. I remember your rock lobster was quite offended. At that. Speaking of offense and offense taken and offense given, let's see what you're up to, what you're angry about, and what you're excited about, because it is time for the Thursday mail block. It's time to take your seat on the All Star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. Uh. <laughs> welcome to the mail block. I'm just reading some of these some of these comments here. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, welcome to the mailbox. Someone saying TMI, Mr. Meatball, on your uh, on your on your lack of underwear. So uh, yeah, I'm with you uh, on that one. Welcome to the mail block. This is in case indeed the portion of the show where you guys take the reins, questions, comments, insights, hilarity, pearls of wisdom, all of the above. We welcome it. Used to do it on Monday, switching it to Thursdays, mixing it up a little bit. Uh, also better for Uncle Mike's schedule over there as well to do his strategery on monday let's get into it we also ask you guys questions on occasion this week we're asking you guys you know we do a lot of digging into unusual options flow here at the options insider it's kind of in the name and uh we find a lot of weird ones uh like uh, and some of these head scratching yet sizable ones like of course our tesla puts and so we thought we'd ask you guys which of these following sizable open real options but these are really open right now do you think has the best chance of actually Becoming a winner. I mean, going in the money. I know there's going to be arguments. People have asked us, well, what if you buy these cheap puts and they go up 3x? That's a winner. That technically is true. And all that we agree with, but we're looking at just has the best chance of actually becoming an in the money profitable options for this. So that's what we're looking at. So we gave you four choices. We gave you our old friends. Got to, got to include them. 49,000 of the Tesla at the time was 49,000. Now it's almost 52,000 of the Jan 2019 50 puts. So those are there. Uh, we got another old friend of the network, the uh, VXX Jan 2019 10 puts. There were currently, at least at the time we wrote this up, 197,000 open of those, of including, I'm sure Mr. Meatball has a few of those in his back pocket. We have uh, Uncle Mike's favorite, the GLD Jan 2019 200 calls. There's 65,000 of those. If you're not a, uh, a GLD watcher, listeners, GLD closed today right around 125. So those are 75 handles out of the money by Jan of this coming, uh, this coming January. And to wrap it all up, for the bulls out there, it's uh, 146,000 of the spy Dece 2019 150. That's 150 puts. So that's not quite the S and P getting cut in half, but it's pretty darn bad in terms of uh, what that implies for the marketplace. And there's 146,000 of those bad boys open out there as well. Again, we're not getting into intent, bought or sold, any of that stuff. We're just looking at net open positions, assuming they're long open, and if they are. How do you think, which of these do you think will come to pass first? Let's go to Uncle Mike first. Uh, which of these, I think I know which one you're going to vote for. Maybe you're going to change your mind since Monday. Are you still leaning GLD, sir, or is something else catching in your fancy? I got to go with GLD. Let's have some, we might have, a, we, we could have a global crisis uh, and just get uh, sheer paranoia going on throughout the earth. And uh, that wouldn't be such a, 
uh, crazy reality. So I'm going to go with GLD. And Mr. Meatball, I kind of have a feeling uh, which one you're going to go for as well. Are you going to vote for your old friend, the Jan 2019 10 puts and VXX, or is something else catching your fancy? Uh, what are my options again? So the Tesla catastrophe puts, the Jan 2019 50 puts. You got the Jan 2019 10 puts in VXX. You got the Jan 2019 200 calls in GLD or the Spy Dees 2019s. These are a little bit longer term. They're whole another year, pretty much. 150 puts. Which one's catching your fancy, sir? Oh, um, I like those VXX 10 puts by a, yeah, by a landslide. <laughs> How did I know? I didn't know you got Although I like the Tesla ones, too. I think there's there's something to those puts. Really, guys. you like one year puts in uh, Tesla for fit? Not even one year anymore for fi- at the fifty handle. That's uh, interesting. Yeah, probably not. That's a wee bit aggressive. I'm, I might give you the pars if I look discants, but uh, you're right. But the, the scathing articles out there is going to run out of money within twelve months, et cetera, et cetera. So if you believe those things, and clearly someone does, uh, then these strikes will be deeply in the money within a year. Uh, well, yeah. So far, our audience is kind of split. Uh, right now, actually leading the charge are the VXX Jan 2019 10 puts, probably because we talk about them a lot on Vol Views. 33%, so about a third picking that one. Hot on his heels, though, are the Tesla puts, the Jan 2019 50 puts, doing 31% of the votes. Uh, actually, Uncle Mike, your GLDs have done a little better, about 25% picking the GLD calls and only 11% saying the S&P is going to be cut nearly in half by, again, this is not Dece of this year. This is Dece of 2019. So that's, a, that's the longest term one we have on the, on the paper here. So who knows? Crazy global war cuts S&P in half. Those could maybe come. Only 11% feeling the love there. You got, I think, until tomorrow or so to get your, vo- get your votes in there if you, haven't, if you haven't voted already. Here's an interesting one. This comes in from B, B Tavares, B, B Tavares, maybe, saying, hey, great show. Well, thank you, B Tavares. Uh, he goes on to say, I'm looking at this chart from Financial Times, and it makes me wonder if I should concentrate my trading in the last 30 minutes of the day to increase the liquidity for my options trades. I wonder if this, is all, wonder if this also applies to less liquid options names. And he thankfully included the chart. Uh, it's from uh, FT, I think from a few days ago here. Uh, and they're showing the, this is S&P, S&P 500 percentage of volume during the trading day. And uh, so the first 30 minutes uh, is, uh, and by year and how much it has changed. Uh, the first 30 minutes is like doing a little bit more than 12% of the volume. Uh, midday is, uh, is anemic, uh, much, is much lower than it was, shall we say, back in 2004 when this chart did, when it was pretty much 80% was midday, much less than that now. And then the last 30 minutes of the closing day, which is what he's getting to, this is excluding the closing auctions, is it looks like about 18%, 17, 18%. There's, the legend here is a little bit hard to read. Again, much higher than it was back in 2004 when this chart opened. And then these closing auctions, we were kind of just talking about with Mark, with the, those are the PIP auctions, a little bit different, but similar idea. Uh, the closing auctions here are doing over 17% of uh, the volume again. This is just uh, S&P 500. This is just, uh, just the underlying, so this is not the options. But still, it implies an interesting thing. We talked about this before on the network, how, you know, especially these days and some of the vol products, even in the big indexes, we see a lot of reshuffling, a lot of rebalancing, a lot of algos coming in to adjust and to set up their things right in that last period of the day. So it used to be, yeah, it used to be in the old days when I walked into, let's say, Intel, uh, you know, all the old timers would, would wrap up their devices and their sheets and they would leave the last 10 minutes of the day. And I would say to them, well, where are you going? You know, this is when the good paper comes in. They said, no, no, kid, you don't want to be here. That's when the pickoff paper comes in. And sure enough, I learned they were right <laughs> when you got run over 10,000 times by Goldman buying calls right at, right before the bell. Uh, you do that a few times and you learn. Uh, but that was that was kind of the mentality back then. And now it's it's shifted. There's a lot more activity going on in and around that time. Not to say there isn't pickoff paper, but still uh, interesting stuff. Mr. Meatball, we'll start with you because you're executing stuff kind of throughout the day here for various size uh, have you seen this uh, this data here on the S&P? And has this informed your S&P options trading at all? Uh, no, I haven't seen the data. And no, it, it has not. Uh, you know, I, I I don't like to do a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I obviously try not to trade near the end of the day and, and try and get things done because the liquidity really does dry up after the bell. But, you know, that 3 to 3.15 time, you know, when you're when you need something done, it's not that's, you know, you, you got to do it. Um, but no, I've never. Uh, it, no, the answer is no and no. 
Mr. Uncle Mike, when you're putting out, rolling the puts there for uh, all the folks in the strategic night and all the folks who are your clientele there, uh, do you do you adjust it at all? Do you do a lot of stuff towards the end of the day? Or how does this impact your trading? What do you have to say here for our friend uh, B. B. Tavares? Actually, I have surprisingly more thoughts than you might think that I would have on such a subject. I personally hate trading the first hour of the day just because because there seems to just in my experience with everything that I'm doing, um, there's just a lot of whipsaws going on. And uh, a lot of times if you're trying to roll something, uh, let's say I'm trying to just roll a short put, that last nickel that I need to get to my limit price just usually isn't quite there. Or, uh, so I typically don't like to trade the first hour of the day if I can help it. But if the if the fill is there, then the fill is there, then I'll obviously do it if that's what I need to do. Or if the trade's gone against me and I need to get out, then you, you got to get out. You got to do what you have to do. Oftentimes, though, and, and so for exiting trades for a profit or a loss, uh, I really don't have any uh, preference as to when to get out of a trade. If it's at the uh, stop loss, you got to get out. If it's at profit, well, get out. Uh, so that, that part doesn't really matter. But in terms of getting into a trade or trying to make an adjustment, I actually prefer to trade uh, towards the end of the day. The things that I trade are plenty liquid enough to where liquidity is not going to be much of an issue to me. Uh, so that's not really the case with me. It doesn't really bother me in, along those lines. The reason that I like uh, trading towards the end of the day uh, is because for the rest of the day, you know that that trade's not going to hurt you. Now, granted, of course, you are. Uh, you can get hurt by a trade at any time. Of course, there can be a gap down at night or something like that. But I just, from a mental thing, uh, from trading and just uh, how I like to do things and how, how it works, I like getting into a trade and then in case I am second guessing myself or in case uh, I have any type of self doubt of the trade or uh, there's nothing I can do about it because the market's closed anyway. So I personally find it easier for just uh, my own uh, life balance, so to speak, when I'm entering new trades and th there's nothing I can do about it right shortly thereafter. Uh, I can turn my brain off. I've already done my analysis. There's nothing I can do at this point. And then let's say I am second guessing myself. Well, maybe should I have sold that put or should I have rolled that call or whatever the case may be? I can think about it when the market's typically not moving. Now, granted, uh, you have times like today when the, the S&P is up 10 points uh, and the future is shortly about uh, right after the market because of Amazon earnings. But typically, there's not as much movement in the markets. And if I am second, if I do second guess myself, then I can think about it with a clear head. Because then, if you're second guessing yourself during the day and it's going against you just a little bit, you might tend to do something that actually would not have. So, getting into trades, I just have a personal preference of trading towards the end of the day. Getting out of trades, whether it's for profit. For a loss, I don't have much of a preference, uh, but typically I hate the first hour of the day and try to avoid it if I can help it. It's interesting. So it's more of a, a psychological reason for you to trade at the close than, than anything else. It keeps you uh, keeps you sane. It sounds like the trade at the it close. It really is. It really is. It's interesting. That's that's, a, that's that's one of the first times I've ever heard anyone. People always give me all these liquidity driven reasons. I've never heard anyone argue psychologically. It's it's, it's better for them with the close. But then it makes a, it makes a certain sense of that. Is, that is your mindset. When do you guys trade? I'd be curious. Hit us up. Let us know uh, when you like to get yourself. I get a lot of you probably do it all throughout the day. I get that. But is there some time? Maybe like Uncle Mike, maybe you agree that the closing stuff is a little bit easier on your psyche. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you can't do anything. And so that that terrifies you throughout the overnight. I don't know. Hit us up. Let us know. Uh, like uh, Yancey here, that's the next question here. He says, um, he listened to our interview earlier this week with Tom Sosnoff. He said, I heard Tom Sosnoff say on your interview show that he thinks there are 20 active names and 75 tradable names uh, as he termed it, in the options market for retail. And that's about it. Do you uh, do you concur? You know, we talk about this a lot. That's one of the reasons why I brought it up with Tom, because, uh, you know, they're obviously they're catering to the active retail. And we see a lot, you know, we've had uh, Henry and his, and his stuff on the, on the network a lot of times. And, you know, the data, all the data we see says that pretty much, not even 20, about 19 names pretty much dominate the options market. They do about half 
of all the options volume out there. You know, your spies, your vixes, your, you know, your Facebooks and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the names you've heard of and typically probably trade <laughs> uh, probably fall into that top 20 or so. And if you're trading those, they're deep, they're liquid, they're fine. You can get filled. All this pipe, pip stuff we're talking about, but getting filled and getting price improvement. You can get it all in those names and you're pretty good. As long as you stay usually reasonably close to at the money and usually reasonably close to front month. You go six months out and 20% out of the money, even in those names, you're going to get a little bit wider. But in general, they're, they're pretty good for the most part. Then he mentioned, I thought it was kind of interesting. He said his idea was about 75, what he termed tradable names that are active enough to get in and out of throughout the day. I think that was interesting. I thought that was actually probably charitable of him. I probably would maybe cut that in half or at the very most like two thirds of names that you could reliably get in and out of without really having to work it too much aggressively and having to wait for fills or having to, the worst case, hit bids and lift offers to get stuff done. Uh, but there is interesting. There is this kind of what people have termed before the illusion of liquidity in the option space. And if you break it down, there probably are less than really 100 names that are really accessible for the lion's share of uh, the active retail out there. Again, that's what he was kind of primarily addressing. Uh, Mr. Meatball, you agree with that number? You think it's more or less? Yeah, I think that's about right. Might even be 50. Um, you know, you've got the major indexes and ETFs, then maybe 50 single names. Single name liquidity stinks. Uh, you know, names you've heard of are impossible to trade in. Caterpillar, you know, John Deere, uh, all the, Walmart can even be hard. Uh, liquidity stinks, uh, and that is a problem. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I thought 75 was charitable on the on the back end. So he, he was saying about 100 names you could really trade back and forth. I'm with you. I think it's probably more like probably maybe 50 of the latter and maybe uh, 20, 20 definitely of the former, and then maybe, if you're nice, 50 of the latter. So you're talking under 75 names that are really uh, – that are really accessible to the broad public out there. Mr. Uncle Mike, are you going to take counterpoint on this one, or are you kind of with us? I'm with you, and I'm even more with you than I think you are almost, because it was probably about eight or nine years ago, one of the main reasons that I stayed away from a lot of individual names was for this reason. I mean, it would drive me nuts when I would see a stock that I love, and I look at the bid-ask spread of the of the call and it's like 75 cents by a dollar five or something like that put out an order for um 90 cents or whatever you're thinking okay i'll split it maybe i can get filled on it and that was fine when i'm just trading my own money and doing a 10 lot or a 20 lot or something like that but then when you got to start trading some size when you're trading other people's money and you want to get 100 filled or something like that that became an issue real fast so i, I mean you guys hear me on the show there's very few individual names that i trade in ever and it, it is for that reason that i that i do stay away from them because there's nothing more frustrating than getting a partial fill on a name that you thought would have enough liquidity and you have to take a worse fill because you want it, you have to get all your clients filled by the end of the day uh, or even worse get all your clients hedged by the end of the day and in the right way and you can't roll a hedge to where you want to roll it because it's not liquid enough and you get killed on the on the bid, bid ask spread for it so it's for that reason that i pretty much changed my whole methodology of trading about eight or nine years ago and uh, so i am totally with you on it uh in individual names with the exception of a few liquidity stinks there you go. You heard it uh, from the horse's mouth. Not me. <laughs> That's kind of depressing to think of it that way, but it's, it's the reality uh, of the options market. So hopefully you like those uh, 100 or probably really more like 70 names uh, because that's pretty much... That's pretty much what you got, unless you want to stick with Spy and some of the other big indexes out there. Right, let's keep on rolling. It's our final segment. It is time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block. This is where we tell you what we're watching for the rest of this week into the weekend. Before we do that, really quickly, let's do another quick check-in on our earnings friends that are popping off after the bell today. Amazon was pricing in about 90 bucks 
or about 6%, and in the after hours, up about 98, or over 6%, about 6.5%, and actually intraday, they're up another 4%, so it's been uh, rocking and rolling out there in Amazon land, so so far, they're keeping uh, their gains out there. Microsoft, they're pricing in a little bit shy of 4 bucks, right around 4%. Uh, let's see here, in the after hours, they were selling off, now they're rallying a little bit, they're up about a third of a handle, so pretty much about a third of a percent, because they're right around 100 bucks. And, yeah, so it looks like their sell-off in the after hours has mitigated somewhat, but still a pretty reliable premium sale, at least so far. They got down as low, let's see here, in the after hours, they got down as low as about 92. So, actually, at one point, they were off uh, over, uh, they were off over two bucks, about two and a quarter. So, about half of what their straddle was, but now they've since uh, rebounded out there. So, patient premium sellers, so far, at least, doing all right out there. And last but not least... Uh, we got Intel. Intel is pricing in about two and a half bucks, and looks like they're kind of blowing the doors off that. That's about five percent, and so far they're up about four and a quarter, or over actually about eight percent exactly uh, up there in uh, Intel. So good day for Intel. Good day for Amazon. Remains to be seen on Microsoft. They may end uh, the day, open up tomorrow up, but either way, perhaps this keeps the bull market uh, rolling along for another session. That said, Mr. Meatball. In addition to earnings, what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of this week into the weekend, sir? Uh, we got we GDP tomorrow, uh, and that that could that could move things. Uh, you know, right now it's looking like we're going to have a, a decent up day based on the earnings we've got, but we got a couple more big earnings, and like I said, gross domestic product uh, is uh, going to be announced on uh, tomorrow. So I think that could be a driver. Gross domestic product. Who watches such crazy macro things? What are you? What are you? The I'm, vice, I watch you the gross viceroy? national product, not gross <laughs> domestic product. That's just me, though. Yeah, well, you are. You are quite the gross fellow, as witnessed earlier in the show. Rewind it if you come into us late, uh, listeners. And last but not least, Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of the week into the weekend? Well, I mean, we're positive on the year again in the S&P 500 just after today, just going uh, and with where we're at right now. I think tomorrow is also going to be just another key day in that can we hold on to being positive for the year in addition to earnings and the, the GDP as, as to what Mark said. Uh, I guess the only concern that I would have from being the bull with which I, the bull concern is that we don't want another 2015 where we keep going a little bit up and then a little bit under and then we're just kind of like a magnet to staying the same throughout. The, so, but wanting to see if we can hold the game for the year as little as they may be now and uh, see if we can build on this with uh, the mighty Amazon we can build on this <laughs> well fortunately listeners that music means we've come to the end of our journey down the lazy river that is the options market oh what a journey it's been lack of liquidity VIX the Amazon Microsoft your crazy questions all sorts of fun stuff keep them coming we love hearing from you guys but before we go one last time around the horn. I'll start with Uncle Mike before his, uh, he uses up the last bit of the internet out there in St. Charles, Illinois. Uncle Mike, sir, if people are interested in perhaps learning more about what the heck it is you do out there in between your visits to Skippy's Heroes and Lemonade, where should they go? What should they do? By all means, give me a call or shoot me an email. Email mtosaw at rcmfs.com or give me a call. My direct line 312-212-3531. If you want help going down this lazy river that we call the Amazon, uh, feel free to contact me. There you go. Hit the man up, m 2 saw at rcmfs.com to learn more. Maybe you want to sling some skew. Maybe you want him to babysit your puts so you don't have to. Maybe you want him to do the closing day trades so you can just go out and play with your kids. There you go. Let him do it. Let him worry about it so you don't have to. Mr. Mr. Meatball, if I want to learn about things like VXX erosion or how to make VIX more complicated or perhaps less... Or perhaps if I want someone to manage all my volatility exposure for me, where should I go? What should I do? Uh, if you want to learn about VXX and things like that, email me, marketoptions.com. If you are an accredited investor and want a smarter way to be long the S&P 500, uh, email me, mark at carmenlinecapital.com. With a K, listeners, Carmen Line with a K for all of you out there who don't spend your days spelling lines of demarcation. In the, uh, in, the, in the atmosphere there. Uh, it's a good one for you. And on behalf of the Greasy Meatball and Uncle Mike and D myself, I thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, all the fun stuff that you do, including asking great questions. Keep them coming. And we'll see you next time for more of The Option One.
The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com. 